I find that the defendant has not met the uh, requirements of the statute and uh, to indicate that while this circumstance was certainly unknown, it does not have a material bearing on any of the prongs of the triad. Uh, so I'll deny the application. I will note, however, to you, Mr. Anglada, in the event that he is not successful in going into recovery court, I note that these are third and fourth degree offenses. No doubt the state has made a prison term offer, although I don't know that. But if you would like to pre plead him open and seek at sentencing treatment opportunities, I'll certainly keep an open mind. I appreciate that, Your Honor, and I appreciate you uh, taking the time to hear my motion. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'll sign an order and get it uploaded later on today. Uh, Mr. Dewar, your counsel will meet with you, let you know what's going on. Good luck with your drug court application. Thank you. All right, Thanks, thank Christine. You. See you later, Christine. Bye. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, everyone. All right, we'll take the next matter as soon as the uh, Corrections Department is ready. Scott Swain. And uh, Lynn Juwan, if you're listening um, on Court Smart, you can pick up this uh, motion and draft an order uh, denying. Thank you. Judge, I'm just going to step away for one minute. I'll, I'll be right back if that's okay. Of course, Ms. Pacer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they'll probably call in. Yep. Yeah. Actually, your, your speaker's working now, so we don't have to call in. Okay. I'll be right with you. Just give me a moment. Gail, is that Scott Swain? Yes. All right. Thanks, everyone, for waiting. Let's now call the matter of the state of New Jersey versus Scott Swain on Cape May County indictment 19090459 uh, for an application for detention and carrying arraignment. May I have an appearance from the state, please? Uh, Julie Mazur on behalf of the state. And for the defense? Eileen LeBarn standing in for Elton and Glada. Good morning, counselors. I see Mr. Swain is uh, with us in the jail. Can you hear us, Mr. Swain? Yes, sir. And you'll recall I advised you the last time we're conducting this hearing virtually. All the same uh, requirements that I described before will abide by this hearing. Do you understand that? Yes. That means we're going to conduct it on the record, treat you fairly. Everybody's going to get a chance to be heard, and then I'll make a decision at the end. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I note that the uh, defendant has been indicted, so a probable cause determination is based on the indictment. And at this point, then, I believe we would just move to detention. Uh, Ms. Mazur, I'll let you go first. I'll ask you to give, give a brief factual underpinning for the record to support your application for detention. Yes, Your Honor. Um, it is the state's uh, contention that there's no amount of monetary bail conditions or combination thereof that would ensure this defendant um, would not be a danger to the victims in this case. There are four, and I will go into them, um, and to any other victims, uh, that he wouldn't obstruct the criminal process and that he wouldn't flee. Um, I will note on the public safety assessment, there is a no release recommended um, with a score of a 4-3. His current charges, um, he was indicted in one uh, indictment. His current charges involve four separate victims. Um, 
dating back to 1997, um, the most recent case being in 2019. Um, I'll start with the danger to the victims and future victims, um, as that goes really into the facts of the case. Um, in 2019, he was accused of um, he was accused of attempted sexual assault. Um, he was at a bar around the 4th of July um, in Cape May County um, and went outside uh, down by the bay with um, the victim, C.J., um, where he started punching her um, and trying to sexually assault her. Um, she was screaming so loud that luckily people heard her and she was able to fight him off. Um, he was trying to take off her pants. Um, they found when they eventually found him, they found blood on his clothing. Um, when people heard what was going on, she eventually got free and was able to, to find some witnesses. Um, they tried holding him, but he pushed away um, and ended up running away from the scene. Um, he was eventually apprehended during a DUI stop um, when they realized that these charges were outstanding as well um, in relation to the, the case um, at the bar. Um, Going backwards from there, there's charges that are, let me just make sure, I think that's enough. Um, in 2017, um, while he was conducting his business, essentially, um, he would go into houses uh, to either give estimates or do some work. And in two separate times with two separate victims, one being KB and one being KM, um, with KB, he was found masturbating um, in the bathroom um, when the victim found her, found him. He actually kept going to, to stay in view of her um, and then tried to pay her money to, so that she wouldn't go forward to the police. Um, so in that case, there was uh, a, a witness tampering aspect of that case. In 2017, he was charged for a very similar offense. He was doing work at a house uh, involving a KM. Um, and during that time, again, he was masturbating in the bathroom. He was caught when he was spending a lot of time in there. Um, the victim walked in and found him masturbating and, and, and stopped him. He continued to masturbate in front of her and then actually grabbed her um, vaginal area at that time. Um, the latest offense was in 1997, um, but it happened two through the year of 2000, it's a case involving KF, who was his ex-wife, uh, wife at the time. Um, she came forward and told the state that this defendant, um, on multiple occasions, um, would force her into having vaginal and oral intercourse. Um, at multiple times, he strangled her to the point of her becoming unconscious, and he would continue um, in the act um, during the the oral intercourse, he would force her holding her, um, holding her by the head and the hair um, and forcing her into these acts. And she said that these happened during 1997 and uh, the year 2000. Um, it actually went further past then, but um, due to the statute of limitations, the state was unable to charge anything um, before 1997. Um, those are the four victims that are involved in this indictment. Um, Going back to the 2019 case, which triggered all of this, um, when this defendant was charged, um, it became evident to the state that, number one, he fled from the scene. Um, so I'm, I'm actually I'm going now into obstruction and, and flight, um, which are kind of uh, go hand in hand in this case. Um, when he found out about these charges, um, right on the scene, he fled. Um, he was then picked up for the DUI and he ended up talking to the police um, quite candidly um, about the one offense, uh, not giving too much information if I might just reflect on my notes. Um, but he did speak to them briefly about the offense. And in that case, I wanted to note also that the, the victim, CJ, was able to point out the defendant on scene and tell, tell the witnesses um, and police officers who he was. He actually told her during the offense exactly who he, who he was. 
um, he said, my name is Scott Swain. And everybody at the bar knew who he was. He actually, during that time, sorry to backtrack, but when that happened, he actually, after he was tried to be stopped on scene, um, his credit card was on file at the bar because he had been there and the bartender knew him. And he actually, right before he left the bar, demanded his credit card paid in cash and left the bar um, again in the state's uh, it's the state's position that that was um, in, in an effort to not be identified. Um, again, yeah, he did speak with police um, that on July 3rd. Um, and then after that is when the state became involved. At that time, he was placed on a summons. He was released. The state became involved and realized the severity um, of the issue um, and the, the past victims that were involved. Um, and the, the charges were changed and he was put on a warrant. It's the state's position that Mr. Swain became aware of that situation. And um, that's when he became, uh, began his efforts to try and flee. Um, the state has been looking for Scott Swain for nine months now. Um, the reports were, I think, released last week to defense counsel regarding this defendant's efforts and the state's efforts to bring him back to the United States. Um, he had his brother-in-law purchase him a ticket to Turks and Caicos where he had another residence. Um, his attorney, we are on the record in this case in uh, court, and his attorney advised that he knew he was in Turks and Caicos and that he had been advised or been made aware that he would not be returning to the United States to address these charges. A bench is a warrant was issued at that time. Um, at some point, he has been in contact with family who has told him about the charges. Um, he chose to stay in Turks and Caicos. The FBI actually became involved in this case um, when they became aware of the severity of how many victims, of what this defendant is capable of. Uh, during his ex-wife's statement, um, she described not only um, this defendant's obsession with hurting women um, and his enjoyment in watching them um, in pain as he does these things to them, um, but she witnessed it firsthand for herself. Um, so the FBI at some point became involved in order to bring Mr. Sweeney back to the United States because of the severity of these charges um, and how long it's been going on since 1997. Um, and these were the only the cases that we could charge at this point. Um, <clears throat> after being in Turks and Caicos, even though he was aware of these charges, at some point he then fled to the Dominican Republic. Um, it's the state's position. I know he got on a plane and came back here, um, but he bought two plane tickets to come back here, one into New York and one into New Jersey. It's the state's position that again, he was trying to deceive um, the state and trying to knowing that charges were out there and probably a bench warrant, which there was, um, and he was picked up in New York, but trying to deceive and try and deviate from his plans and try and, and not get picked up on these charges. Um, ultimately, he was. It's also the state's position that he probably didn't come back to this country um, due to this virus and the pandemic going on. He was most likely um, removed from the Dominican Republic because of them not wanting tourists in that country at this time as because of what's going on. Um, so I don't believe that he came back here voluntarily. Um, he was caught in New York and ultimately brought back to Cape May County. Um, but since then, we've actually submitted another report to defense counsel. Um, he has been contacting our victims. He has been reaching out. Most likely more witness tampering charges will be forthcoming. Um, and he has advised that not only with the witness tampering, he has told his ex-wife that if she doesn't drop the charges, he will kill himself. Um, he has also advised that he will leave again um, should he be released, um, which is very disturbing and very, um, very concerning to the state um, about his release. I just want to make sure I haven't missed. Again, Your Honor, he is facing first degree charges. He's facing second degree charges. There are four victims with very similar stories as to how he physically hurt them um, in an attempt to them to sexually assault them. Um, and again, it is the state's position that there are other victims out there we were unable to charge on, that there are victims in other states, obviously, we do not have jurisdiction over. 
Um, and the FBI was made aware of all of this and found it so concerning that they actually did get involved, open up a case federally um, in order to bring him back here. Um, and they were unable to as he kept moving around to avoid apprehension. So it's a state's position that he should be held at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. State, Thank you. you have uh, in your evidence, you mentioned uh, statements of, of victims alleged in the case. Uh, is there any other ev evidence, physical evidence, forensic evidence, uh, surveillance um, evidence, anything like that? As to the 1997, there is not. It's the victim statement. In uh, the 2019 case, I actually, just double check. There are multiple witness statements because they heard the victim screaming for help. They saw her in distress and they saw the defendant running away from the scene. Um, there's also the statement of the bartender who knew him and he came running in to ask for his credit card back. Um, there's surveillance footage from uh, it was at Harpoon, um, Harpoon's by the Bay um, in Cape May County. There is surveillance footage, not capturing the exact event, but um, capturing them going out to the Bay area. Um, and again, there are those multiple witness statements. The victim did um, provide a statement. She did have um, some blood on her clothes. I do not know at this point if it's been analyzed because the defendant had just been apprehended. Um, and he was found with blood on his clothes when he was apprehended uh, that night. And those are awaiting testing? I, I don't know if they were sent up yet because he was not apprehended. So every, I'm not sure if they are in that. We do have them, but I'm not sure if they've actually been sent for testing yet. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I've marked for the record uh, as States Exhibit 1, uh, the indictment, uh, together with the underlying complaint warrants. I've marked as States Exhibit 2, a public safety assessment, which was dated April 1st, 2020 at 9 a.m. with a recommendation of no release based on the nature of the charges and a score of four and three and the prosecutor's motion S3. Uh, Ms. Labar, I'd be happy to hear you on release and if you have any other evidence you'd like me to consider. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge, Mr. Swain is uh, 54 years old. He uh, does have, have significant ties to this community. He has um, been a lifelong resident of Cape May County. His sister actually owns uh, Swain's hardware, hardware store in Cape May. Um, he's also a painter. He's, he's employed uh, with Swain Painting. He has other community ties. He's been a prominent member of uh, the community as an active member in his church and a, a member of the Kiwanis Club. Um, he does deny um, that he attempted to flee. He says that uh, he has, um, for the last eight years, he has, uh, or I'm sorry, that um, he used to spend eight months a year in Turks and Caicos as a tennis pro. And that's actually where he was returning from through the Dominican Republic. Uh, when he was detained at JFK Airport. And he denies fleeing there at the time of being aware of the charges. That was a, a prepaid trip. He was in communication with his attorney at the time, who was uh, Mr. Sandman. Um, he also uh, has, according to his PSI, he has one prior indictable conviction that dates as far back as 2007 with no violence on his record. Um, when he was returning from uh, New York, judge when he was detained, he was held at Rikers Island and there he was exposed over the weekend um, while he was there to the coronavirus. And as far as maximizing public safety, I would argue that, that the best place for him to be